it's such a small world that we are all here and we're all from Toronto. You know, yes, like born and bred Canadian, diehard, like Scarborough girl. I mean, yes, the world is a better place because we have three Canadians on a podcast. Yes. Hi there. Hey, Lana, what's going on? How are you doing? Hello, Rebecca. Hi, Hi everybody. Welcome to where we're at. So yeah, wondering it. where you all are at. Oh, my gosh. So, so many topics coming up. Um, we honestly, one of the big ones that we've talked about from the very beginning, you and I are hormonal shifts, right? So yes. this whole thing that goes on in your 40s and your 50s and your 60s with our hormones. Um, a lot I'm of going people, out of whack and us like, I mean, <laughs> it's like a roller coaster, never knowing what's going to be happening. And I think a lot of people, when they think of middle age, they actually really go right to these hormonal yep. shifts. This is the yep. most kind of widely known thing. And it's, you know, I get really hate when men say, oh, she must be in middle age. She must be in menopause. Like My crazy. son the other day was joking with his friends as he's gaming on like Fortnite. And he said, he goes, oh, don't mind my mom. She's in, she's got menopause. And I was like, what? What do you mean I've got? It's not a disease. But um, I think he was referring to maybe my, um, my, my edginess as a result. Of right. <laughs> I like the way you put it. Edginess. Yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. So but yes, the biggest, <laughs> biggest drivers, right. In our middle age and this community seems to revolve around health and wellness, which of course, hormones go into that. Um, and as we navigate the second half of our lives, we are actually looking for a combination of expert advice and also information on healthcare. And on top of all that, we're having conversations with our friends our, let's call them our midlife sisters in arms on this topic of I like shift. it. I in like your 40s, it. 40s, your 50s, and your 60s, right? Exactly. And one of the women who is at the forefront of this is Dr. Jessica Shepard. Her practice is based in Dallas, Texas. She does tons of speaking engagements, huge presence on social media, and her upcoming book. Generation M is coming out in October. She is a board certified OBGYN and women's health media expert. And we are so, so excited to have her on. I do actually remember when my mother was doing HRT, right? And she was like, oh, I have to stop. I have to stop. There's this big right. thing it's causing cancer. So do can you just go backward a little bit? Because, you know, mm -hmm. your practice is truly amazing and, and your social media presence in particular, because it makes it accessible to all of us. Can you go back a little bit and tell us why there is this stigma surrounding, um, well, I guess hormonal shifts, yeah. first of all, and also, you know, treatments for hormonal shifts. Yeah, I'll start more at the study, which was the WHI study. This was one of the most pivotal studies that was done when we think of women's health. And the, the real focus of it initially was to look at it as a prevention for heart disease using hormones. And so during that study, which had more than 45,000 women, it was like in the late 90s. And so they put women on estrogen and progesterone, and then they had another arm, which were, they were only on estrogen. And during the study, what they found is that there were women that did have a slight increase in breast cancer. But what happened was that that got out to media. And instead of really looking at it from a scientist perspective, the media was like, hormones are bad and stop. And that's all everybody heard. And so to me, I'm like, first of all, this is probably one of the most or the first times I've ever seen science and media kind of like like go full course where people were like, oh, I'm listening to medical information through the media. And then we on the back end were like, wait, everybody wait. Because what we did is after that came out, when we're like, yes, there are some increases in breast cancer. We went back and looked at the study, which is due diligence of what scientists do. And it was then that we realized that it wasn't even the estrogen that was increasing this breast cancer. It was the progestin that was used and also the women that were in the study were not ideal for what we should have been looking for at that time and hormone use in a sense. So there are so many things that should have been, I guess, given with the information that weren't. And now we, you know, reap the benefits of not being on hormones. And now we're at the stage of being like, hormones are actually really beneficial. But how do you get a message out like that after having this like, literally like running around the room, like arms raised, stop hormones. And now we're like, okay, guys, actually you can't, that's not an easy message to kind of go back on. 
it's like the inoculations for young children and the, you know, this, uh, this tie to autism, which was totally debunked. But I remember I was, you know, my kids were born in 2005 twins. And I remember they, they hit a year and we're supposed to get those. And I'm like, Oh no, no. And a friend of mine who was a doctor, he was actually worked at children's hospital in Los Angeles. He said, listen, Okay, uh, so where are you getting your information saying don't get the inoculations? Where is that? And I said, well, Jenny McCarthy says that it causes autism. No, but listen, he went through this with me. Dr. Jenny McCarthy. But by the way, and no no slide to Jenny McCarthy. You know, she's really good at what she does, but she's not a doctor. And she didn't do the research. And and he said, okay, so Jenny McCarthy. And then on the other side, he said, you've got all of Western medicine is saying, yeah, these are probably a good idea, right? This is probably a good idea. So again, Rebecca, one side we have Jenny McCarthy. On the other side, we have... Western medicine. <laughs> That's similar to what's happening, you know, with with this right now. You have uh, um, in social media a lot of this celebrity presence. Um, that's talking about it now that, it, well, I mean, it's, it's the opposite end. Um, a lot of celebrity presence, it's even just bringing it to the forefront. Mm-hmm. No, they're not doctors. So although I, you know, I'm sure people are like, well, Oprah says, but at least there's this huge conversation around. Yeah, it's bringing the conversation back to the table. And I think in that we still have to be careful with making sure we have evidence-based, we have unbiased um, kind of uh, information. Obviously, a lot of information is shared with social media and, and YouTube and whatever. So it's it's a good in a sense, but the, sometimes the bad part of it can be was this vetted information in a way that is good for my health or is it just sensational information, which sounds good? So my daughter who's 26 will always, whenever we see her, she has something for me. Oh no, no, no. You know, I'm taking this, I'm doing this and no, you can only eat that. And I'm like, Oh, where'd you get that from? Oh, I saw it on TikTok. (laughs) I'm like, Dr. TikTok. (laughs) Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My patients come to me and they're like, I heard this thing through and I'm like I'm waiting for it and they're like TikTok I'm like "Uh uh-huh I knew it (laughs) so Dr. Shepard this is a really good segue into you have this book that's coming out and I'm I'm obviously just reading a little bit about it online it's called Generation M correct yes so the way my practice is set up now is I did traditional uh, medicine for 15 plus years but what I really found was that there's so much more to um, ourselves in whole health and whole body, which encompasses um, our emotional health, our sexual health, uh, how we look at nutrition and movement and exercise. And that always plays a factor into our overall health and what we're able to, uh, how we're able to be our best version of ourselves. And so if we don't kind of connect all the dots for, for everyone or allow for evidence-based medicine to really have some space with what we call functional medicine and or um, just behavioral modification and lifestyle changes, then we're not really getting anywhere. And so that really is generation M is now that we're kind of like, you know, I guess you could say we're a little bit more open to saying I'm perimenopausal or menopausal is to saying it boldly and saying I'm part of generation M. And in that, I want to give you this uh, ability to see how do I want to present in my 70s, 80s, and 90s, and how can I do that work now? Because I don't want you to wait till you get to your 70s and 80s and 90s to try and, you know, turn the tide then. I want you to start doing that work now, and that's what we're able to give you in Generation M. Well, um, just what you're saying, evidence-based medicine, it's just so interesting that uh, now that has to be like, that has to be prefaced, you know, the word medicine has to be prefaced by evidence based because during COVID, you know, that was really when a lot of that broke down, um, with all of these people, you know, a lot of the members of Congress and of the house that, you know, kind of trying to debunk Fauci and say that he didn't know what he was doing. Right. Um, well, I'm no doctor, but so yeah, no, you actually are not a doctor. So where, why is there a, but and it, so it's just so interesting that that the word medicine has to be prefaced by evidence based. Um, yeah. You know, you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> we kind of, you know, spent a lot of time in school figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shepard, so I, I'm full disclosure. I was just talking to Lana and Lisa, our producer, before you came on about the fact that I have a teeny little patch now giving me some estrogen down on my bikini line and I'm taking a progesterone pill 
and it has changed my life. Honestly, so amazing. Um, so I guess what we want to try and get from you are, you know, kind of the first signs that you would tell somebody to look for in perimenopause when they're, you know, starting to go there, what, what they're going to see, what they're going to feel in their body. And at what point are you saying, yeah, maybe you want to talk to your doctor because they're interrupting. Like for me, it was interrupting my sleep, um, mm -hmm. my quality of life. And that's why I really had to, the hot flashes were just so intense. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, signs and also when to consider HRT? So perimenopause is that time frame, kind of as you're dialing down and your estrogen starting to kind of check out a little bit, but it's over the course of, um, can be seven to 11 years, right? So it's a, a, usually in your fourth decade and you just start to, your ovaries start to kind of not give off as much estrogen as it used to in your, your reproductive years in your twenties and thirties until you get to a point where you don't have a period anymore. And that's menopause, right? So if you were to loosely term it, menopause is when you don't have any more bleeding, perimenopause is you can have some subtle signs and symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, irritability, mood changes, decreased libido, drier vagina, as you're still having this bleeding. Okay. So the, the difference between them really is in perimenopause, you will still have a period, whether it's regular or irregular, doesn't matter. Menopause is you're not having any bleeding, but the symptoms, which can be over 34 symptoms of what I just expressed, a few of them again, can occur in either of those stages. Okay. And so that's why it's important that we really kind of understand the differences between the phases, but also understand that you can receive hormone replacement therapy during both phases as well, where, which is very different to what we used to prescribe because we used to say, we can't give you any hormone replacement therapy until you are proven menopausal. And so that's where a little bit of the management has changed over the last five years is that we're like, as you're starting to feel these symptoms and have hot flashes, night sweats, decreased sleep or interrupted sleep and libido, among other things, we can also give you hormone replacement therapy. And that's where we are. Today. Yeah. If you don't have all of these symptoms, uh, like, like I, I'm not on HRT, um, which was not to say I wasn't irritable and, you know, had, had many of those symptoms. <laughs> that's a whole other story, but you know what I mean? So I'm not on HRT um, because I didn't feel a lot of those things were affecting my quality of life. Um, but, you know, you, I am now reading, you know, that hormone replacement therapy might be, uh, so, you know, there's research with that with Alzheimer's and prevention. And, you know, my father passed away a year and a half ago from Alzheimer's. So, um, you know, maybe that's something that I might want to look into further simply, you know, with my, my personal worry about that, that's the road I'm going down. Do you use it preventatively like that? I look at it two different ways. I look for hormone replacement therapy um, as symptoms, ameliorating or relieving symptoms. And then I also look at it as a pillar of longevity because it contributes to bone health, heart health, brain right. health. I also offer hormone replacement therapy for people, whether they're having symptoms or not, to kind of balance and be preventative for some of the other things that come later on in life. So I look at it in two different ways. You've also talked a little bit, I believe, online um, about testosterone, correct? Yes. Yeah, testosterone, I think, just generationally, and if you look at it historically, was never really put into the category or conversation with women, right? It was always looked at as the male hormone. So a lot of women are actually very surprised when they're like, wait, I have testosterone. I'm like, yes, I do. We have it in much smaller amounts, but we still have it. With that being said, during the perimenopausal phase and into menopause, um, we do have uh, a decrease in testosterone as well as estrogen. The thing is that there are estrogen and testosterone and progesterone receptors all over our body, our brain, our breast, our bowel, like everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so as you start to see a decrease in testosterone, that's when you start to see a decrease in libido, which is because okay. they adapt to the receptors in the brain. Uh, you also see a decrease in um, kind of like executive functioning, as I like to call it, with like your memory, kind of brain fog and, and all of those things that you do. 
with your brain and functioning. And another feature to testosterone is that it impacts bone health. And with bone health, we do see that as we start to decrease in testosterone, bone health diminishes. And that's why you see a lot of women who later on in life have fractures and falls and whatnot, because they don't have that substantiating estrogen and testosterone as well. Uh, everything decreases, basically, all three of them. Yeah, I and I just, you know, I don't like push, I'm not pushy with it in the sense where I'm like, someone has to be on all three. I really try to extract one, how they feel about hormones, or some people who are still very hesitant about it. So mm -hmm. I don't want to be the pushover and being like, you must take all of these things. I want to <laughs> I'm your pusher. <laughs> right. I'm like, so let's talk a little bit about, are there alternatives for somebody maybe that HRT and hormone replacement is not appropriate for because of their maybe culturally or even they have a medical situation? I always look at it as contraindications or someone who should not be taking it because outside of that, then everyone becomes a candidate. Right? right. Whether you want to or not, you're still a candidate. And so for those who should not be taking um, hormone replacement therapy should be people who have a history of breast cancer, personal history of breast cancer, not family mm -hmm. history, personal history of cancer, or if they have a significant hormone um, receptor positive family history of cancer and there's some concern. And mm -hmm. that's what you talk through with your doctor. Um, I will say that there was a study that was released last year and around October for breast cancer patients who have had breast cancer. They actually actually can use vaginal cream in a form of estrogen. They just can't take a pill patch, uh, some of the other forms that are systemic. So for patients who have dry vagina, mm -hmm. um, they can um, take vaginal estrogen cream. Okay. So that's really important because that was a very big breakthrough uh, because basically all forms of hormones, however you take it, were off the table for breast cancer survivors. Can you talk about the different modalities of, of delivery um, systems for HRT? Yeah. Breaking them out, uh, estrogen probably has the most, uh, I guess you could say, modalities. When we look at a pill, you can do a patch, which is what you have, Rebecca. Yeah. And then you can also do like a foam. You can do a cream. Um, and then you can also do a pellet, which is what we insert into the fat of the buttocks. Um, and ouch. Then, oh, it's not ouch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we numb. <laughs> we numb before we do. Yeah. <laughs> um and then we also have, in progesterone form, you have troches, which are kind of like uh, sublingual pills that can dissolve in your mouth. You can do oral, which is you swallow and goes through the GI system. And then progesterone also has creams. I'm not a fan of the cream, but it's still available. Um, and that's about it. And then testosterone... You can do in a gel form, which is what you would apply to your skin, also a cream that you can apply to your skin. You can do injection form of mm -hmm. testosterone and then also pellet form, which is in the same form of inserting it into the fat of the, of the buttocks. So when you're taking, like, I mean, is there a difference in, I guess it's each person is completely different as to the length of your treatment or how, you know, how long you're going to be taking it or, um, you know, the dosages. That's where you get into the technicality of it, right? Like, what do you think you should take based on your symptoms? What are you comfortable with taking? What's the dosage at which we start? And, and that's where labs come into play on baseline labs. What are we trying to get your level to? But also, what symptom are we trying to address? When we come to labs, you, I really try not to focus on what the lab level is to raise the level of your lab by what I'm giving you. The, when we take a blood test, it's telling me what that organ is producing, what's circulating through your blood. Me giving it to you, what we call exogenous form from an outside source, whether it's a pill, the patch, whatever it is, is not going to replace the level of what your ovary was giving you, estrogen or testosterone levels. But it is a good guide to help us see to make sure you're not having too much but also more importantly, is, is your symptom revolved? And that's what I like to focus on as well. How are you feeling? Because what might work at a dosage for you may not work as a dosage for someone right beside you. And so I can't use that always as a gauge of, I'm going to give you 0 0.06, 0.25% or milligrams and someone else that, but then both of you have different responses. Because then, then that's not working. I need to increase the amount that someone's 
needs to get if it's not working for you. You know, you're in the States, you're practicing in the States, Rebecca's in, in Canada. Here, all of this stuff, like they're just going to the doctor in and of itself is an expense. You know, the healthcare is a huge expense. And I'm not saying you don't pay for it in Canada, it comes out of your tax money, but it's it's very different. Um the, this kind of stuff is not necessarily something that's covered. Um, so now you have like out of pocket expense and all of this. So there becomes a, you know, what we were saying in the beginning, this disparity uh, between who can and who cannot. Yes. I think the best way to look at that is, and there's different ways to look at this. I do believe our healthcare system when it comes to women health does not uh, create ease for women to access the things that they need. So for example, when Viagra was first released, it took six months for insurance carriers to cover them. Which, which is short, right? Incredibly short. Very short, which is very, very, very short. So with that being said, when we're still fighting for some forms of, whether it's hormone replacement therapy or drugs that have come on the market for fibroids or endometriosis, which are all women health based, we're still like fighting. We're like, can you just cover the thing? Just cover the damn thing, please. Yeah. And with men, they're like, absolutely, Viagra is covered. No question about it. Because that erection is completely necessary. It is so important. It is so important and vital and key to everything. <laughs> and vital for them to like, you know, keep going. So when you look at that aspect, yes. The other thing that I would say is we have come to a phase in our life where investing in our health is not the most popular. And I say that not from always a cost perspective. I'm talking about when, you know, recommendations on nutrition and or movement, things that always always don't have an exorbitant cost. Not many people love that route right? Investing in your health really requires a, a mental change and fortitude and understanding that you're making an investment for long term, not for tomorrow. Um, so that's a harder message to sell. And so when it comes to hormones, there are those that are covered and those that um, you can get coverage for for your insurance. I wouldn't say all of them. There are some. Then there are some that do require cost. And I would definitely say that there are those who are like, you know what, my quality of life or how I would like to feel um, is so important to me. I'm okay with making that investment. Again, I'm not saying that everyone should have that type of attitude, but for those that can, I really sometimes help people shift the narrative of, of what the cost is for versus some of the things that they choose to spend cost on in other parts of their life. But there are some who doesn't matter what it is, they can't afford it. And I get that too. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create the landscape for that people sometimes do have the ability to invest in their health, but choose not to. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very true. It's like a whole mindset shift. And I mean, like, you know, certainly our kind of age group, um, you know, the Gen X, we, many people, not everyone, but many people ha have, you know, kind of come towards that, the importance of having a quality of life. Um, certainly like my parents' generation, you know, it was like quality, but why would you think about that? You you need to, you know, you start here, you work towards this, you get towards that. The, the thought of, am I feeling good? Does this make me happy and bring me joy? Does, you know what I mean? Like, you just kind of, you, you gritted your teeth, you bore it and you just moved on because you had to raise your kids and pay your mortgage and there you go. Um, and there's still a lot of people with that mindset. I understand what you're saying. So even just that idea of whether it's doing yoga, whether it's meditating, whether it's going for a walk. Isn't it amazing just as you're, you know, listing those small things, they, they really are small things, but it requires your mind to change. So for example, and it's not like I'm perfect at it either, but I'm very aware of it. So I try to make it in like, bite size approaches, not this exactly. huge task that people have to like overcome. That's why yeah. I'm always like just five minutes of mindfulness or 10 minutes of stretching. And my goal is like, make yourself the priority where 15 minutes can be devoted to you. If just 15 minutes, right. And then that starts to catapult into all these other things of how you feel throughout the day, making sure that we literally, there'll be sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm at the point of overwhelm and I'm doing too much and I will take five minutes and I will just like realign and recenter. And it does so much, but you have to do the thing and also learn 
the algorithm of or the routine or how it's going to fit into your life. And then all of a sudden it just becomes part of your routine. One of the biggest things to, or, or hardest things to do with your brain is change a routine, right? And habits that we form, whether they're good or bad, are always hard to change. I want to be part of the 5 a.m. club. And I tell you, I will hit that. Oh, no, <laughs> that will never happen. For me. I, in no. my head, I'm part of it. And my, my clock is like, no, you're not. Stop lying. I will set my alarm and I'm like, I'm going to do it today. <laughs> and I, know. I I tried that one time. I did get up at 530, did a six o'clock class at the gym or 515. And I was like, you know what? I'm never doing that again. No, it's not for me. The few times that I've done it, I'm like, this is amazing. But then I'm like, can you do it again and again and again? And I'm like, I can't. It's very but then you're exhausted at 8 p.m. <laughs> well, I think just I think once people know that, you know, like one of like I I meditate. Um, and I I've talked to, I mean Rebecca knows that. I, I've talked to people about it. I don't sit and do a half an hour or an hour, sit on my my thing with my, you know, hands out home and you know, trying to I, I honestly, I use an app. It's guided. Some of them are just like seven minutes. Yes. Um, sometimes I don't even get out of bed and do it. I'm lying down because you can lie down and meditate. Um, but once people, I think, know that whatever it is you're doing, uh, it, it you start with, start small, start with five minutes. So, yeah. okay, you want to go for a walk? Start with a five minute walk, walk around the block, start with that. Then it, maybe it's a 10 minute walk, but it, it, you don't have to start with like a full gym routine, right? Or going full yogi. Um, you know, that's, that's one intimidating have to look like Lana Ogilvy in the end. Like we can just aspire to be our own, our own self. If I said to you, what are the three things that you think can make a difference if your hormones are wonky? I would say when, when it comes to hormone health and we're going through this transition for women is we are all going to go through, right? A hundred percent of women are going to go through menopause. Like you can't avoid it. How that experience may be different for each woman, but I do feel that hormone replacement therapy, and it's not to say that you have to do it, but it really does offer a benefit to how we feel, but also yeah. our longevity. So I would say that when we think of hormone replacement therapy is just to sit with it. If you are apprehensive and just think about your life's course and how it can benefit that. The next thing that I would say is nutrition is such a huge pillar of health that we often neglect and nutrition can completely impact how we start to live out our later lives in our fourth quarter, as I like to say. And I think that we should pay more attention to nutrition and how it is actually a form of medicine, which can be good medicine or bad medicine, depending on how you use nutrition. And then the last thing that I would say is our bodies truly function on what we're able to do with our muscle mass. Our muscle mass is imperative to our, our older years. And if we don't start to build our muscle mass from this point in our life, then we are going to have kind of this disease of, of aging. Some of the biggest reasons why women die when they're older is because of heart disease is the number one killer of women, which has to do with the estrogen as cardioprotective. So when we look at our muscles and muscle mass, we can't absorb glucose in the correct way for losing our muscle mass. And so being able to improve our muscle mass so we can take in our glucose and utilize as energy is going to decrease our risk of diabetes, our risk, our risk of weight gain, and also falls. So I think looking at our body as a whole unit is so imperative and really tending to it from a, a fundamental building block perspective, rather than just waiting till we fall into a disease state or illness to try and fix it then. And what are the women you're seeing in your practice, middle age? What, what yeah. are we lacking in terms of the nutritional? We're lacking component? protein. Um, it's never been a part of the algorithm of how we've been taught nutrition. We've just been taught we're obviously living in a society where it's very carb heavy. So it's not that carbs are bad, but we just don't prioritize proteins in the way that we should. I think that um, when you group protein intake and also building your muscles through weight training, that really is the key um, in how we can see our ourselves physically and also mentally uh, be able to withstand aging as much as we can uh, when we look at those two factors. 
how can we help other women in the community who might not, maybe culturally there's a stigma, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe again, we talked about the socioeconomics behind it, mm-hmm. but how can we help other women? Cause you just said something that was like, Oh my gosh, you're like a hundred percent of women are going to go through this. Yes. Right. Well, how knowing that a hundred percent are going to go through this, how do you tell us to pass on the word? What, what can we do to help with this message? I think the best way, especially, you know, for the both of you who have an amazing platform and the ability to reach so many women is, and I use this in my practice as well, is always to start with why are, what is the hesitation, right? So it's not so much to push the narrative of this is why I think you should do this. It's just like, well, where do you sit with it? Where is that, that area where you struggle with And how can I help you from that place? So you want to meet the person where they are. And so to really kind of get to that level of why they're there, why they think that, what they've heard, what someone told them, maybe it's a past experience, then you can work from there. Because then I'm like, oh, well, that was that the reason? Well, let me help you because now I know the reason why you may not want to do it. So your OBGYN meets psychologist is what you're telling me. (laughs) 